Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Lit RPG Podcast. I am Ramon here, here, and we bring you the latest Lit RPG news, reviews, and of course author interviews. Uh, this week is episode number 91 of the podcast. Uh, getting so close to episode 100. Had to figure out something special to do for that particular episode. If you have any suggestions, feel free to send uh, a comment into feedback at Podcast. Can we say feedback at geekbuyspodcast.com um, or litrpgpodcast at gmail.com. Whatever works for you folks. Uh, but this week I have five new lit RPG reviews for you. I know that's not as many as I normally do. Uh, however, in my defense, I have uh, one of them is over a thousand pages. Uh, so that kind of counts right. I like, think like three or four regular size lit RPG novels. So that kind of makes up the difference there. Uh, also, don't forget to check out the interview I did with Jeff Sproul this past week uh, this past week as well. Uh, author of Sigil Online Hellions, which just came out. So go check that out. Nice uh, superhero lit RPG is the second book in that series. Uh, the first one, I believe, is Paragons. So, but you can check out the interview on our website at uh, geekbestpodcast.com. Uh, okay. Um, also, let's see. In the novels that I'll be reviewing for you this week include the one I just talked about, the interview I just did uh, with Jess Browse, Sigil Online, Hellions, also the Dungeons and Burdens, Slime Dungeon Chronicles Book 4, which is the last one in that particular series, according to the author. Uh, also, Legacy of the Fallen, that's a Sendal Line Book 2. Yeah, I know there was another one between Book 1 and Book 2. That was more of a side story. This is actually the next story for for the main character uh lyrian rastler uh and then also uh, let's see you know four, four is going to be transcendental misappropriation uh and then last but not least is going to be lockout of cthulhu a lovecraftian lit rpg novel um it's also called the load rpg or horror story somewhere in like the regular title but there it is that those are those are the five folks but of course we begin our show though with lit rpg news Oh, also, if um, if I happen to look like totally super sore uh, and move around a little stiffly today, it's because uh, Charles Dean, uh, the author, yep, uh, has has come in on a a very tight regimen of exercise and uh, a dietary restrictions. Uh, apparently, some people were complaining that I'm starting to get a little comfortable in my my old age on the podcast, uh, and you know, we've decided part of the new year we're gonna help each other. Get in shape. Uh, so we started that today, and, and man, am I sore. So there you go. Uh, but in, in actual Lit RPG news, uh, we're going to have only one story. It's only one like thing that happened that involves the entire community. Uh, Blaze Corbin, author of the Delvers LLC and SO, is planning to create a whole new website dedicated to helping people find good game and Lit RPG stories. Um, he plans to, with the help of other authors and community members, to create a, a almost a review aggregation site for for various game and little RPG stories. Um, if you want to help support the endeavor, he's actually set up a Patreon page uh, that he hopes to use to get the funds to make a well organized and streamlined site. So if you want to go check that out uh, and support him or that particular endeavor, it is patreon.com forward slash game lit RPG. Uh, and some people may say may ask isn't this kind of what you do ramon i'm like sort of yeah except that i specialize very specifically in a little rpg that's the thing that interests me um blaze plans to expand essentially kind of the same thing i do with some other uh game related subgenres like lit fps um game lit and some other guys so it's uh, all the best luck to him and i definitely plan to support him myself Okay, and that's uh, it for a little bit of news. Some stories that have come out recently that I have not had a chance to pick up uh, or read, I should say, is uh, Soul Reckoning, which is the second book in the Veil Walker series written by Isaac Winter. Also out is Etheria Offline um, by Cube Kid. This one um, seems to be based very much on uh, Minecraft, uh, I, so I'm not sure how legal that works but it's out there if you want to go check it out i uh, have not read it yet i plan to read it later uh, also out is down she falls a lit rpg um 
<laughs> the World of Ignat series book one. So there you go. Uh, and also out is God's, sorry, War God's Mantle uh, Ascension, a little bit of adventure, The War God Saga, written by J.E. Hunter and Aaron Crash. J.E. Hunter, you might remember from the from some other series, uh, which we'll be talking about later. Okay, um, in Little RPG audiobooks, there's some quite a few that just popped up, uh, including Critical Fire's Book 5, uh, Harmon Cooper's The Last Word of Ungaia, Book 2, uh, Eden's Gate, Book 3, The Sands is also out as, a, as an audiobook, and Jay Hunter, this is the same author, the Artificer, author of the Viridian Gate Online series. Uh, so if you like his stuff here, you might want to check out his newest release as well. Uh, also written with another co-author. Uh, and also out is Encode, which is the third book in the Next World series. And also out is Don Chapman's Desert Runner Paternia Online Book One. So that one is out as an audiobook as well, read by Andrea Parsnew. So uh, quite a few new audiobooks that just dropped this week. So go check them out. And of course, in the show notes, we have links for all of our reviews for the ebooks versions of all the stories, uh, in case you can't remember if you have already read them or not. So there you go. Okay, uh, upcoming little RPG. This is just where I list off the titles that I, I didn't know about are coming up. I um, have a, quite a few new entries this week um, to the list. This includes uh, Headshots, Two in the Head. Uh, the author sent me a notice saying that he planned to publish this week. He didn't give me any cover art, though. He did give me a, an advanced reader copy, so I plan to read that this weekend. Uh, but he did say he planned to have this out uh, this week uh, coming up, so I'm, I'm just putting it out that it should be coming up. Um, also out, uh, sorry, out also supposed to be coming up is Dungeon Crisis, a little bit of dungeon core adventure, um, book two, um, it is out on January the 15th, uh, the trap of the potentate art, dark herbalist book three, that one will be out on January the 17th on the 22nd of January. This one's actually kind of a surprise. It's a different sides of Feyrol book seven. So that one just kind of popped up. Uh, on the 22nd of January to be the laboratory book three, The District, a futuristic denticore novel. So on the 24th of January to be The Reapers, The Neuro book three, which I think is actually available as a hardcover currently, which is a little weird, but it is. It's out there. Um, on the 30th of January, it'll be returned to a dungeon. Uh, this one is new. It's a monster MC lit RPG book. Uh, very nice cover. Um, very interesting title, I should say. So uh, looking forward to checking that one out on the 30th of January. On the 1st of February, it'll be Bushido Online, Friends and Foes. Uh, so this is the second book in that particular series, I believe. Quite a few people enjoyed it. I didn't like book one personally that much, but some of the folks really did enjoy the change of pace as far as like the setting goes. Uh, so it'll be out on February 1st. Uh, February the 28th, it'll be Kingdom Level 4. On the February sometime, uh, this is Sometime in that month, according to the author, uh, the last book of the way the shaman will be out called Clan Wars. Uh, March the 12th, it'll be Avatar's Rising Silos Book 1. And March 16th, it'll be Achilles Reign, Paternia Line Book 4, again by Don Chapman. So there we go, folks. Those are all the stuff I know about that's coming out in the near future. On to new releases and reviews. <laughs> And in new releases and reviews, I'm going to begin with, of course, the first book that we have here. It's going to be Hellions, which is Sigil Online, book two, written by Jeff Sproul. And again, a really good check out that interview that I had with the author. It was nice guy, very entertaining. I met Jeff um, in person at Dragon Con in 2017, which is just last year, which seems like a weird thing to say. Um, and really nice guy. He was a quest giver, which was a cosplay. It's all explained in the interview. Um, also learned that he has a steampunk tattoo and he has experience designing games. So that kind of explains his interest in Liberty besides being, of course, a avid gamer. Uh, the review portion of this though, if the novel is 303 pages, $3.99, it is available on Kindle Unlimited, which is always nice. I will read you the author's description. For Riley and his friends, Sigil Online has never been more real. With the latest expansion, pain has been enabled and, na and will now affect all players in-game. Aptly named Hellions, the expansion introduces monsters, but not the kind that Paragon's been fighting for the past several years. This time, the players can be the monsters that they once sought to destroy. But in a game where playing means having the money to survive in the world, what will Riley do when death in the game doesn't just mean an end to his character, 
but an end to his life. Um, there we go. Okay, uh, full disclosure, the author sent me an advanced copy for review. I purchased the novel as soon as it became available. I, you know, quite, I, I like to support the authors that I review sometimes. Um, now, um, basic review without getting any spoilery. This is, this is a very action filled transition into a huge world expansion. Um, just to give you a, a quick recap, book one tells the story uh, of a new experience of Riley as he restarts his character in a permadeath enabled superhero VR MMO. Um, the, the game system itself and Paragons and such online, I should say, has some very interesting progression mechanics where items play a very big role in the progression system. Like there are tiers of powers and there are also levels, but the levels um, automatically increase your stats so that the character, like the players don't assign stat points necessarily. Um, but the thing that they can change and can modify is the items that they get. Like the items that they receive in game not only supplement their stat points, but they also can also actually modify their actual powers and abilities, whether it's increasing range um, or giving them more um, damage possibilities or heal possibilities, or even just like uh, changing the way the powers work on a fundamental level. Um, so items are a big thing in this, in this game, according to book one. Um, in book two, uh, the story shifts a little bit from that individual story from the main character, Riley, and is less focused on the individual progress of the main character. Instead, the novel kind of focuses on player versus player action. And that's kind of the big thing in this particular novel. It's supposed to be, Hellion is supposed to be the name of an expansion pack to this, uh, to this online game called Sigil Online. And where players, um, when they die, they lose their character. Um, but, but with this new expansion, players don't have to re-roll a new hero character. They can re-roll a new villain character. Uh, so it's very much in the line of um, City of Heroes, Series of Villains, where the, the players can play villains or Hellions, as they're called in this particular instance. Um, and in this particular novel, it focuses on Riley and his friends as they uh, make their own guild. And they go on these um, uh, quests or the, these adventures to, to save the city from the Hellions. Um, but it's a very super action-oriented. And there's some very good battle scenes, I have to say. Um, but there are some negatives that kind of drew away my personal appreciation and enjoyment of the story. And that's mostly because it is, it is, it is, it is a shift from what the emphasis was on in book one. And I think that's good for some people and for other people, they're going to be like, Oh, I miss those things. And I was kind of one of those people. Um, for example, there's almost no real world plot development. Um, in book one of the series, uh, the main character, Riley, it was a super big deal. The fact that he lost his job and that he was playing this game to make a living. In book two, that storyline almost doesn't exist. Like there's a few references to it, but that development of anything meaningful in the real world, not really an issue anymore. Basically, Riley is kind of set. Um, there are also just a few plot lines and story points in, in book two that get muddled um, as introduced by the, the novel description um, with the Hellion expansion, there is an introduction of a pain mechanic in which uh, players actually feel pain. Um, and it's a very interesting idea and it raises the stakes in the story in a very sword art online kind of way. But um, it's not really consistently described in all the stories and, and I should say in all the fights in the story. Um, in some fights, uh, the heroes are just getting their butts beat and the main character is, is getting injured severely. Um, yet he doesn't seem to feel the effects of pain as is described in, in earlier portions of the novel where even getting a paper cut or, you know, getting hit by friendly fire uh, is severely painful. Um, so there's a little inconsistency there. However, the biggest issue in the story is probably going to be the ending. Um, there are issues with like lesser RPG mechanics in there, but I guess that's a, sh a shift in focus. But the biggest issue for a lot of people is probably going to be the ending of the story. And it was for me, at least. Um, like I said, most of this is like just for action oriented. And if you're looking for that, great. But the end just was this weird, huge twist that for me just kind of came out of left field. Um, I didn't think there was any foreshadowing of it. And I, I, it kind of left me shaking my head. I was like, what? What? Huh? Like, where is this all coming from? Who's this guy? Why is that person suddenly acting that way? Like, it, for me, it was not, um, it, it didn't line very well for me. And I, in, in a larger scope of, like, this series, it absolutely leads directly into book three, where there's supposed to be, like, um, some new mechanics, like city building or whatever, um, introduce them, kind of spoil the mechanics for you. Um, but in book three, there's a bunch of new changes that are coming, and this ending in book two definitely leads in that direction. But as far as, like, um, providing a satisfying conclusion to book two, I'm like, it 
didn't for me because, like I said, the events that happened at the very end portion of it was like, where is this coming from? I'm like, literally, people like appear and I'm like, I've never heard of this dude. And like, it's all, like I said, you can go read it, form an opinion of your own. But for me, it just kind of dropped my level of appreciation for the story um, from a seven to about a six. Like I said, most of the story really good. And if you, if you don't care about that ending, great. If you want something that's like super action oriented and focused, this is going to do you for you. I mean, there's plenty of superhero powers. Um, there are plenty of, of player versus player opportunities and some interesting stuff to having to do with, of course, superheroes and villains and the way that the villains have kind of an advantage in this particular expansion. Very cool stuff there. Um, but for me, again, just dropped it just enough. I'm like, oh man, I can't give this a seven out of 10 because that ending just like, like, was not enjoyable for me at least uh like i said overall everything else is like really quite fine there's some other issues of course we talked about um but for me uh, sigil online hellions gets a six out of ten but uh, don't let this stop you from go checking it out it's on kindle limited if you like book one you're probably gonna like book two okay on to our next review it is uh jeffrey falcon logs the dungeon burden the slime dungeon chronicles book number four okay this one is 500 40 pages, $4.49 is available on Kindle Limited. So this one is quite beefy itself. Uh, let's see, the author's description. It's the final battle. The Empire plans to come to fruition. Durin has fallen, and with it, the other city-states of Neharta. Only the dungeon town remains safe. But for how long? While the leadership struggle to deal with crisis, the dungeon dwellers watch on. As Doc continues to unlock new slime evolutions, Rowan deepens his bond with Millie. And the two experience much together. When the final attack begins, will Rowan and Doc stand with the townspeople? Why has Doc been framed for murder? Who is the traitor lurking in the shadows? Everything comes together in this final epic tale of dungeon glory. The chronicle ends here, but the war and the dungeon have only just begun. So there we go. Um, this again is the apparently the final book in this particular series uh, for the dungeon for the dungeon chronicle series. So this is the end, and actually has a, re- a pretty good ending. Like they're they're. All the storylines are, are tied up for the most part. Um, there is potential for the author to return to this particular character and this particular dungeon later on if he so chooses, but he doesn't have to. This is not a bad place to start. Um, and as of the uh, time I wrote this actual review, uh, this novel was listed as number one in spine chilling horror, which makes me kind of giggle and laugh um, because I didn't know that there was such a category in Amazon. Um, and I guess Amazon think that this is a horror story. It might have something to do with that creepy skull, you know, on the cover um, and that early description of the novel, like the dungeon murdering adventurers and kind of tearing them to pieces so the slams can devour them. Uh, that might be part of it. I don't know. Um, but this is a pretty easy review for me. I had a good, good time reading it. Um, this has long been one of my favorite series, um, and it's an enjoyable ending to the series. So there you go. Uh, there's some nice sub stories in, in the novel. Um, some that are sad, some that are funny, some that are even romantic. There's political intrigue that's introduced and some nice new slime evolutions. Um, however, there is very little dungeon diving in this particular story. And if you read the story, it all makes sense as far as why, uh, but just a heads up. Um, most of the early parts of the story, they're really just like a gigantic setup for the last 25% where like this, there's a huge series of battles and they're really kind of epic and I enjoy them personally. Um, more than, you know, worth the wait in any way. like the last one from is just like plot twist and, uh, action galore. So good stuff and a great way to end the series for me. So uh, dungeon burden, slime dream chronicles book four for me gets a score of seven out of 10. I had a good time. Okay, on to Legacy of the Fallen, a send online book two, written by Luke Chimalenko. So there we go. Uh, this one is 731 pages. It is $6 even. Uh, it is available on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, now, full disclosure, the author sent me an advanced copy for review. Uh, I purchased the novel when it came out, but I should think this page count on this novel is very much off. Like when I read it on my, uh, my e-reader phone, application it says it's like 1400 pages and usually that roughly translates like me knocking up about 30 percent um and that's what amazon usually says but in this case amazon is putting it like 730 pages which i think is 
is incorrect. I think it should be at least a thousand pages long. It's a ton of words uh, in this particular novel. Um, so just heads up that this is probably beefier than you even Amazon realizes. Um, author's description, though. Fresh off their victory over Graves and his followers, Marcus and his friends have managed to enjoy a few weeks of relative calm and peace as they continue to build Alford, preparing the town for a new wave of settlers coming from Iberia. As the, but as the days wore on and no sh- new arrivals in sight, they begin to fear the worst, eventually setting out to search for their promised reinforcements and soon realizing that they aren't as alone on the frontier as they thought they were. Just managing to rescue a caravan of settlers in the nick of time from a horde of bandits, Marcus and the rest of Virtus have barely have the chance to catch the rest before they find themselves thrust in the middle of Iberian politics, revealing a plot that threatens to not only take away their hard-won independence, but to destroy Alfred completely. So there you go. That's the author's description, and that is all very true. Um, so there you go. Um, this is a great second book in the Ascent Online series. There's all the action, adventure, and leveling, good lore, and game mechanics, and NPT stuff that you come to lore from, from book one, um, that you come to love, I should say, from book one. Um, but for me, the thing that always stands out in this particular novel and in this particular series is the author's gift with dialogue. And what I mean by that is the fact that when I read about the conversations and the banter between Lurian and his group, it always makes me feel like I'm hanging out with old friends. And that to me is is just a joy. Like every time I read these novels, I'm it just makes me so happy to read them because it feels like I'm hanging out with friends and we're going on adventures together, and uh, you know, like I'm playing this game with my friends or something, and I, I I'm invested in their in their well being. Um, and it, it like I said, the author just has a way of making you care about these characters, and and just feel so welcomed into this world. And I think that's. Um, not the case with every novel that I read. Like other novels have other, you know, high points and everything. I just think that is this novel's um, secret formula, I guess, and that it, it pulls you into the world and it makes you care about the characters and it makes you feel like you're just one of their gang and friends. So there you go. Um, of course, there's also other thing, great things here. Uh, great, huge, interesting variety of fights. Old enemies return that you know, you didn't like, and they're still bad people. Um, there is th- new threats, of course. Uh, there's an introduction of some political intrigue. So the novel's um, enemies are actually changing and they're becoming more complicated as a storyline. Because, I mean, for me, political intrigue, I can never write it because it's it's annoying to me. Um, and it just makes my brain crazy when I think of it. Um, and so the fact that it's done here and it's done well is kind of nice, I have to say. Um, there are also some new developments for the for the town as more player characters come in. Um, some you might recognize from other Ascend Online books. No spoilers, but you know, you'll see them here as well. Um, and of course, with new players come new issues. So there you go. Um, but again, uh, one of the few things that could probably say about the novel, like mm, maybe could have been modified a little bit. There's a, a kind of a too long of a dungeon run about the middle of the story. It's about 20% of the entire novel, which for a thousand pages is kind of significant. Um, and I think it kind of went on just a little bit too long. Not that it wasn't enjoyable, but like that's a, that's a long dungeon run. Um, like I said, Besides that small little thing that didn't really draw anything away from it, I really did enjoy reading this novel, um, and I just wish the book three was ready. I enjoyed it a lot. It gets a score of 8 out of 10 for me. That's Legacy of the Fallen Ascend Online Book 2 with a score of 8 out of 10. So there you go. Okay, on to our next review. It is uh, written by Robert Harper, Transcendental Misappropriation, Book 1 of the Pentacle series. So there we go. It is 380 pages, $3.99, very nicely priced. Um, It, however, is not available on Kindle Unlimited, so not everybody's going to have a chance to pick this up. Um, It is, again, about $4, just slightly more expensive for for an ebook, but for the page count, it totally makes sense. Um, And here is the author's description, short description. Danny's life was going to hell. He had a steady job. I'm sorry, Danny's life was going well. Very different statement. Um, He had a steady job and plans to buy his own place. That was until some rogue junk mail decided he needed to change of scenery. Now Danny's got a new start in another world and he needs to make sure he doesn't squander this opportunity at making the most of his new life. So there we go. Um, Now, if that doesn't tell you anything about the story, 
I understand. This is, again, a, a slice of life reincarnated into an RPG world story. So there are a couple of things here. One, the main character gets reincarnated from our world when he dies as a chemist to um, a fantasy RPG world. So there you go. So he starts out as a baby, actually as a as a as an as a baby inside of his mother's womb, if you want to get technical. And then he's born and he he lives his life. And that's pretty much what the story is. The story starts out with him there, um, being born and kind of figuring out, oh, I'm a baby again, except that he has all the memories that he had from his old life on Earth. Um, and he has access to a very interesting mechanic called a sanctuary, which is kind of a, a mind space palace. If you ever um, watched the BBC show Sherlock, uh, it's kind of like that. And the, uh, the main character can kind of go into his own mind and he sees a room and he sees a bunch of books on walls. And all those books have things like uh, his stats or his uh, skills that he has. And that's kind of the RPG mechanic that the author is using to reflect the main character's growth in the story. And that's that's the RPG stuff there. That will later on in the novel books into things like magic or combat skills and a bunch of other stuff. And as the character grows, the more skill levels he gets, the more things he can unlock. So it's very much progression in an RPG fashion. Um, but there is also the slice of life um, aspect to this, right? And that's mostly what this is. Um, there's no huge big plot. Uh, there's no like evil overlord trying to take over the entire world and the main character is a chosen one to stop them. Nope, none of that exists. It really is just the main character growing up, learning about his family, learning about the world around him, and an RPG progression system as he tries to figure out what magic is and learns new skills like mercantilism and other things. Um, this is again a rather long book in itself. And going through it, I basically realized that there are three main story arcs. Um, the first one is the infancy arc, as I call it. It's from up until like the 1 to 25% mark. The main character realizes, again, this is going to be a little bit spoiler, folks, so if you want to skip ahead, feel free to do so. But the reason I say is because I almost have different reviews for each section um, and aggregate them for, for a final review because they almost feel like three different parts of a story. Like the author really could have um, put this as book one, book two, book three. And it wouldn't make perfect sense uh, as far as like the the encapsulated arcs. I believe this was written uh, originally as a serial online and then kind of put together. And there's more of it online if you want to go check it out. Uh, but the first arc, the infancy arc, is the first 25% of the novel. And this is the point where the main character is he's on Earth and then he's reborn after he dies. And it's really about him realizing that he's existing in a fantasy world with RPG mechanics. And the thing I kind of liked about this particular part of the story was that you get to see this entirely new world from the point of view of an infant and later on like a toddler um, and then a young kid. Um, and it, it's it's kind of the way that the main character learns and that he doesn't automatically know how to speak the language of these people. He, for example, has to learn it word by word, the same way that anybody else would. He just has the advantage of an adult memory system in that and his ability to, to learn a new language system. And the same thing goes into uh, magic, how the main character, even as an infant, tries to learn how to use magic once he learns that it exists. And he, he t in his mind, he takes it into... Um, he, he looks at it from like a scientific point of view because he was a chemist in our world. But the physical reality for him is that he's an infant and he has to get changed by his mom. And there are little hints as the story goes on and the way that the world is seen through his eyes that uh, things about culture and world building. And I really like the way that the author kind of sprinkles it here and there the same way that uh, a, a child or an infant will learn it in real life. Like they don't get to know everything all at once. They don't go to school necessarily as an infant. So anything they do is they learn is things they picked up from their parents. And I thought that was a really cool way to um, let the reader learn about the world the same way that a child would. I, I liked it a lot. That's probably my favorite part of the entire novel is that first 25%. Because a lot of it is just the main character figuring out how magic works and it's a very interesting and intuitive way to look at a magic system. So enjoyed it. Uh, the next arc is the magical Academy arc. And that's from about 25% to the halfway point in the story, 50%. Um, and the title tells you anything. I mean, these are my titles. <laughs> the author is not actually titling these, but that's what is happening. Um, at a young age, the main character is sent away to a magical Academy where he has a rich jerk arrival. He learns about, um, more like uh, learning from like teachers and books about magic and the larger culture of the world. And there's more world building there from that perspective. Um, and the thing I like the most about here is because you, the main character actually gets to learn the formalized version of what magic is and how he's a little overpowered because he, he's had like seven years of like self taught magical training and experience. Um, and I, that was kind of cool to see him do more experiments in the magical Academy and become even more overpowered a little bit. Um, so good stuff, enjoyable. 
Now, the last part, the last arc, is from about 50% 50 mark to the 100% mark in the story. And this I titled The Adventure Time, because that's mostly what it is. Uh, The last arc of the story, again, I'm not going to spoil any details, but the main character mostly devotes a lot of the story to um, adventuring, killing monsters, going on quests, fulfilling... um, you know, job or quest requirements, whatever. Um, there's a, l- a lot less magical theorizing here than there are in the first two arcs. And that's fine. Stories have to change and expand. And because we m- remember from the author's point of view, this might this story might have taken him a year, two years to write, you know, a little bit at a time. And so story changes to go on. Um, but for me, I this last section, this last arc, kind of lost the stuff that I was really enjoying about one and two. And that's just fine. It, it is what it is. Um, the, the action's not boring or anything. It's just, you know, it's fine. Uh, there's also a little bit of a harem thing going on there, uh, which is weird for a seven-year-old in the story, and then eventually like a 12-year-old. Uh, but, you know, it's fine. Um, again, not my favorite section, but it's not like horrible or anything. It's not bad. It just wasn't as good as arc one or arc two for me. So, okay, overall, had a good time reading the novel. Um, again, I especially like the sanctuary inner mind palace aspect um, for the RPG mechanic, RPG mechanic. Really unique. Um, I thought it was really cool. Um, and again, it is a slice of life story, though. So not everybody's going to like that. So if you if you don't mind reading something that's like a daily adventure of the main character kind of story, this is it. This is fun. If you like it, great. This is for you. If you don't like that kind of story, though, if that kind of non-plot story where there's like this big, like actual big story arc, um, don't read this because this is this is going to bug you. Uh, but for me, I had a really good time with it. It was really kind of relaxing to read because I knew just from the beginning, like, oh, this is less of life. This is just a kickback. I followed the main character on his journey wherever it goes. And I don't have to worry about like an evil overlord or anything. So for me, it was, it was almost a very real relaxing read that I could put down and pick up at, at my leisure, and I didn't feel like I was like missing anything. So very enjoyable. Had a good time with it. Uh, get to score a 7 out of 10 for me. So that's Transcendental Misappropriation, book one of the Pentacle series, with the score of 7 out of 10. There you go. Okay, uh, last book. Last book, folks. Uh, it is Lockout of Cthulhu, a Lovecraftian lit RPG novel, Cthulhu World, book one. Okay. Uh, here we go. It is 197 pages. It is $4.99. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. This is the author's description. Some knowledge cannot be unknown. Ruling from the loss of his family, game tester Bobby Walmore is contracted to work his way through an augmented reality park. The headset reveals a virtual world inspired by the horror works of H.P. Lovecraft. The game rapidly turns into more than a paycheck. It's an addiction Bobby cannot turn away from. Every clue he uncovers and every mystery he solves leads him deeper, leads him deeper, the twisted lore of forces, uh, that's what it says, uh, forces lurking in the shadows. And Cthulhu world holds darker secrets than Bobby was ever prepared for. So there we go. Meets deeper down the twisted lore. Anyways. Uh, okay. So the story is again, um, 197 pages, $4.99. So it's a little expensive, uh, but it is available on Kindle Limited. So uh, I wouldn't probably buy it. Um, if you want to just give it a chance on Kindle Unlimited, feel free to do so. Um, this is, again, an augmented reality lit RPG horror story based on Lovecraft lore. So um, so there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, the main mechanic in the story for uh, getting the game stuff there is augmented reality, so which is very which is different than virtual reality. Virtual reality is when you put on a headset or you're in a VR pod and everything around you disappears. You exist in a computer simulation, whether it's going to be interacting with it with wands or whatever, or it links to your mind. So you're existing in the game. Everything around you is the game. Augmented reality differs in the fact that game elements are overlaid upon actual reality. So if you're looking around your room, maybe, you know, if you have augmented reality glasses on, your your cup has, uh, you know, a damage, uh, uh, has an endurance of like one point. Uh, and it has, you know, X plus two to bonus drinking capability or whatever, right? Um, but it's it, it's the game elements overlaid on what's actually happening in the world around you. So that's augmented reality. It, it augments reality. So there you go. Uh, and that's the technical um, technology that the author decided to use in this particular story. So he, the, the novel is actually sent in a, uh, a theme park based on Lovecraft, uh, HP Lovecraft. Um, for those who don't know what that is, it's like um, older story stuff where it's 
like uh, people from other dimensions or creatures from other dimensions um, or just ancient um, entities of the deep. Um, it's supposed to be like this uh, older version of horror where it's supposed to be so sensible, but also like um, mixing in the occult and uh, cultists and just like um, sanity losses. And it's, it's, it's a really complicated subject. There are a bunch of actual like tabletop and RPG games based upon that lore. It's very popular in some circles. And the author is attempting to um, describe in his story a, a theme park based on that. Uh, and it's as, it's as happy sounding as, it, as, as you think it is. Um, the main character, Bobby, is, again, has been, test, has been hired to test the Lovecraft theme park. So um, when he puts on the AR goggles, game elements are added to the theme park. Like there will suddenly be NPCs walking around. Um, but the actual town exists. Like everything, all, all the buildings exist and you can walk in and out of doors. Um, it's just so he has a headset on, he can knock the NPCs and he can actually feel pain, which is weird. I won't get into the, how that bugs me. Um, and he can also hold objects that are virtual. Um, again, no technical no explanation of why that happens, but that's a part of this particular experience with the AR goggles. But when he takes them off, everything's just normal. They're just blank buildings with paint, um, puts them back down. All that paint is gross and ugly and the whole town looks more run down, et cetera. So there you go. So it's a very interesting um, concept. The execution, though, falls flat, at least for me. Um, again, the game mechanics and story, they're there. This is absolute little RPG, no question. Um, but they are basic, and they're consistently used. Uh, the main character, Bob, again, gains stats from interacting with the world and the other characters. For example, when he talks to uh, an NPC, he can gain a charisma stat, uh, a charisma plus one by... I'm drawing information out of them that he needs to complete his quest. Or if he lifts a particularly heavy object, oh, he gets a plus one to strength. Um, or if he sneaks around really well and doesn't get caught, he gets a plus one to sneaking. Um, ultimately, these stats don't really mean the least squat in the story because, again, they're not affecting his real life abilities. Um, and at the most, they maybe augment like the magic powers he gets a little bit later, but that's about it. The one thing that does, again, in the game mechanics, tie into HP Lovecraft is the sanity points. Um, in um, There are several game mechanic rules out there about uh, Lovecraft stuff, but the, the consistent one is a sanity check. Like as the characters see weirder and weirder things, they lose sanity points. And if they lose all their sanity points, they go crazy. And there are ways in, in actual RPG mechanics and actual RPG games where they can regain sanity points, um, but that doesn't exist here. So the, the main character can only lose his sanity as he continues on with the story. Um, again, the, let's see. Um, I've already mentioned the fact that this is based on augmented reality technology. And again, really cool concept. I don't... Um, I'm, I'm, I applaud the author from using something other than virtual reality, but there's a really good reason why a lot of stories use VR over AR. One is because the audience and the character in the story is immersed in the game world when they're in virtual reality. Like if they want to get out of that game, if they want to leave that, that, that system, that world, they have to get out of their pod. And then it's just a shift into normal reality. And there can be two different storylines there. With augmented reality, the main character, and this happens in the story in particular, um, there's a loss of immersion because it's actually in the real world and there are just overlays of game mechanic stuff. And anytime the main character takes off the headset, which happens way the heck too much, um, I lost that feeling of immersion because then at that point, the main character is describing a bunch of dark, empty rooms, you know what I mean? And then he had to put the goggles back on and I had, there was a, a definite effort to have to reimmerse the reader in the story again, as opposed to just existing in that game world and all being there like 100% of the time, whenever that the game mechanics were there, remember the, remember the game story was there. Um, so the augmented reality, while it's a great and novel idea, as far as like introducing RPG mechanics, um, it didn't work here well because the main character just kept taking the AR headset off way too much to reassure himself that what he was seeing wasn't real. And there's, and I, I get it's part of like creating suspense in the story. It's just that again, the, there was a definite loss of tension and immersion when as often as like taking off the headset happened. So there you go. Um, also the story really does rely heavily on like the Lovecraft name to try to establish a sense of like atmosphere in the story and in the, in the theme park world. Um, there's a lot of, Whoa, this is so Lovecraft. And, Oh, this is just like that Lovecraft novel I read a while ago. 
and it happens like a ton, especially like in the first um, 25% of the novel. Uh, and it's just, it just got on my nerves and it just, I'm like, I'd rather the author just describe the Lovecraft elements instead of saying, oh, this is Lovecraft and this is Lovecraft and this is Lovecraft and that is Lovecraft. It just, you know, just got annoying and boring. So that's just my personal opinion. Um, also the main character, super hard to root for. He's a very moody, moody character. Um, very maudlin. And at some point I almost wanted to see him get like murdered and like lose or something. Um, so there you go. Overall, the story lags in the horror department and there are a few like genuinely thrilling moments, especially towards like the end of the story. Um, but overall, just not that entertaining for me. Uh, it gets a score of five out of 10. So there you go. Log out of Cthulhu, a little crafty and little bitty novel Cthulhu world book one gets a score of five out of 10. Not a bad, not a bad story. Well, technically written. Um, it just never really got entertaining for me. And that might just be the fact that this, I've seen other stories do this Cthulhu thing better. Um, so there you go. Okay. Uh, that's it, everyone. That's yeah. See, such a short episode. Look at that. Four, it's like 40 minutes in and out all done five stories. So, and again, one of those was just super long. So that's why there's only five this week. Um, um, but again, thanks everyone for hanging out and listening. Um, if you want to follow us on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or Patreon, um, you can find all the ways to do so at litrbdpodcast.com if you want to support us in any way shape or form and again easy ways to support the podcast share this episode on facebook or twitter any social media outlet you have so that you and your friends who are as geeky and in maybe possibly into liberty as much as you are uh can listen to the podcast and and we can all enjoy this these stories together uh, but again until we can hang out again folks um remember to go read some litter goodbye everybody